Welcome to the Chem 1A Prelab Lecture for Experiment 13, Determining the Heat of a Reaction. Our learning objectives today are to understand the terms specific heat and heat capacity, and to be able to apply the thermodynamic equation heat is equal to mass times specific heat times the change in temperature, and also that energy is equal to heat plus work. Using these equations, we will calculate the heat of a reaction as part of a stoichiometric chemical reaction and see that there is a relationship between the number of moles of reactant converted to product and the moles of energy produced or consumed. Last, you will learn a simplified calorimetry technique for determining the heats of a reaction. Our experimental objectives are threefold. We will first determine the heat capacity of a styrofoam cup that we will be using as a calorimeter. Once we know the heat capacity of this calorimeter, we will use it to perform experiments to determine the heat of neutralization of sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, and also to determine the heat of solution of ammonium nitrate. The second objective is an exothermic reaction, and the third objective is an endothermic reaction. The energy change of a reaction is called enthalpy. We are specifically looking at the differences in energy between the reactants and the products of a chemical reaction. If the products have greater internal energy than the reactants, then we call this process endothermic, as it took energy in order to convert the reactants into products. However, if the reactants have more energy than the products, then energy was released during the conversion of these reactants into products and the overall change in energy is negative. We call these types of reactions exothermic. Exo for exiting. Think of heat exiting the reactants. And endo for entering. Think of heat entering the reactants in an endothermic reaction. There are a number of terms that we will learn today that may not be new to you, but have specific definitions when used to speak about thermal energy and the thermodynamics of chemical reactions. First off, heat is the amount of thermal energy that is transferred due to temperature differences in two objects or solutions. The units that we use for heat are called joules and are represented by a capital J. Specific heat is the heat energy that is absorbed by a pure substance, and so it measures the ability of a substance to insulate against heat or to transfer heat. And so the units of specific heat are joules per gram degrees Celsius. So it's the amount of energy transferred per amount of material in grams per temperature change in Celsius. Similarly, heat capacity is a measure of the amount of heat absorbed by a specific object. So instead of considering the size of a pure substance, as in specific heat, we are now removing the size qualification from our calculation and simply looking at an object as it is. And so the units are simply joules per degree Celsius, so amount of heat per temperature change. Because we are talking about a specific object, the object does not change in size or mass, and so the mass is not included in our calculation. Change in temperature is written as delta T, and it is the temperature change of the final temperature minus the initial. And so it is directional, it is always expressed in this way, final minus initial. These definitions need to be understood in order to determine the heat of neutralization and the heat of solution for parts C and D of today's experiment. Throughout all of the calculations for today's experiment, there are basically two equations that you need to understand. And these equations use the expressions of heat, specific heat, heat capacity, and change in temperature. The first thermal chemistry equation to understand is the law of conservation of energy. This means that whatever the heat energy transfer of a reaction is, that transfer needs to be consumed by either the water that the reaction is taking place in or the calorimeter so that there is zero net change of energy. If our reaction gives off heat, 
then that heat will be absorbed by the water and the calorimeter. If our reaction consumes heat, then that heat is going to come from water and the calorimeter. The heat that is generated or consumed by a reaction has to go somewhere so that the overall heat energy transfer is zero. You will use variations of this equation for each thermal chem calculation that you do in the lab. In order to solve these equations, it's necessary to remember the equation for heat energy. Heat energy is equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature for a given substance. Or if we're talking about a calorimeter, we don't have a mass or a specific heat, but we have a heat capacity. So heat can also be equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature. Heat energy measures the amount of heat energy transferred by one of the substances or objects involved in our experiment. So for the above equation of conservation of energy, where I have the heat of reaction plus the heat of water plus the heat of the calorimeter, this could be written as the mass of the reactant times the specific heat of the reactant times the change of temperature for that one reactant plus the mass of water times the specific heat of water times the change in temperature of water plus the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the change in temperature of the calorimeter. For each of these expressions, it's important to note the final and initial temperature of each of the participants in the reaction. The initial temperature of a calorimeter can be assumed to be that of the temperature of the room. The temperature of all other solutions should be measured using a thermometer. Once you have gathered your supplies and assembled your calorimeter according to part A in your lab manual, it is now time to determine the heat capacity of your calorimeter. Remember that heat capacity refers to the amount of heat absorbed by a specific object, so we do not need to know the mass of our styrofoam cup. So using the first law of thermodynamics, or the conservation of energy equation that I just introduced, we know that the heat of the system remains constant, and so our heat expressions that we would use for part B are the heat of hot water plus the heat of cold water plus the heat of the calorimeter equaling zero. We can rearrange this equation by subtracting the heat of the calorimeter from both sides of the equation. This gives us negative heat calorimeter is equal to the heat of the hot water plus the heat of the cold water. To solve the heat capacity of the calorimeter, we need to expand out the equation for heat of hot water and heat of cold water. So we begin by knowing that the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. We know that one milliliter of water is equal to one gram of water. So if we measure out our hot water and our cold water with a graduated cylinder and take careful note of our significant figures, we can convert the milliliters of water to grams of water simply by changing the unit. We also know that heat is equal to mass times specific heat times change in temperature. So by putting in a mass, a specific heat, and a change in temperature expression for Q hot and Q cold, we should be able to find negative Q cal. So for example, if we were asked to use about 50 milliliters of hot water and about 50 milliliters of cold water, we could have an equation that looks something like this. 50.1 grams of hot water times the specific heat of water times T final minus T initial. So our initial hot water was 58.8 degrees Celsius and when we mixed it with cold water, the resulting temperature in the calorimeter was 32.4. Similarly, we had 49.7 milliliters of cold water, so we convert that to 49.7 grams, multiply that by the specific heat of water, and then the T final should be the same. So that's the mixture of the two waters. So my T final is again 32.4 degrees Celsius, and my cold water was at about room temperature, so it was 20.2 degrees Celsius.
So I solve out the mathematics here and my heat of the hot water was negative 5,533.9 and the heat of the cold water was positive 2,536.9. If we remember that endothermic is donating heat, hot water is going to donate its heat to the cold water. So we should have a negative here and the cold water is going to gain heat from the hot water so we should have a positive expression here. It's always good after doing calculations in thermal chemistry to look at the signs of your energies to make sure that they make sense with your expectations. We next take these values and plug them into our negative heat of calorimeter is equal to the heat of the hot water plus the heat of the cold water. So negative Q cal is equal to negative 5533.9 joules plus positive 2536.9 joules. So negative QCal is equal to negative 2997 joules. And we see that QCal is equal to 2997 joules. We're almost at our goal, which was to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter. However, we are missing one expression. Remember that the heat of the calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature. So we take the heat that we calculated and divide it by the change in temperature. Because we rearrange the equation of Q equals C delta T, C is equal to Q divided by delta T. So here's our heat of the calorimeter and the calorimeter ended at 32.4. We're assuming the calorimeter becomes the same temperature as the water within it at the end of the reaction and that it began at room temp. So 32.4 minus 20.2 we take that division and the heat capacity of our calorimeter is 246 joules per degree Celsius. As you may recall from experiment 6 in which we looked at net ionic reactions, when a strong acid is combined with a strong base, they produce salt and water and also release a significant amount of heat. This is called the heat of neutralization. When calculating the heat of the reaction, we can consider that heat has a stoichiometry of 1, so the amount of heat produced will be proportional to the amount of products produced. Thus, the heat of reaction is given an expression in terms of joules per mole, and this is called enthalpy and given the symbol delta H. When calculating the heat of neutralization, we still use the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. So the heat of reaction plus the heat of water plus the heat of the calorimeter will be equal to zero. So rearranging that, the negative heat of reaction is equal to the heat of the calorimeter and the heat of water. To solve for the heat of the reaction, we perform calculations similar to what we did to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter. We will expand out our heat equation using the specific heat and heat capacity and change in temperature terms. When setting up this experiment, it's very important to note that your initial temperature of the hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide solutions should be as close to room temperature as possible, and also very close to each other, so within 0.5 of a degree Celsius. This is because we will be assuming that our solutions of hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide have the same specific heat and density as water. And so when we expand out our conservation of energy equation, we will use the mass of the hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide in place of mass of water, and also use the average temperature of hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide as our T initial for our change in temperature expression. And so when we expand the heat expressions for the heat of the calorimeter and the heat of water, we get that the heat of the calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity times T final minus room temperature. And that the heat of water is equal to 
the mass of the sodium hydroxide and the hydrochloric acid together times the specific heat of water times the final temperature of the reaction minus the average initial temperature of sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. By plugging in the values that you get from your experiment, you should be able to determine negative Q reaction and then multiply by negative 1 to find the heat of the reaction. The last step in your procedure will be to determine the enthalpy of the reaction by taking the heat of reaction and dividing it by the moles of product produced. In part D, we will be looking at an endothermic reaction that comes from dissolving ammonium nitrate in water. This is called the heat of solution. Some solids require heat energy in order to dissolve, and ammonium nitrate is one of these solids. When you perform this reaction, you should note that the solution becomes quite cold. Similar to heat of neutralization, the heat of solution can also be applied as a stoichiometric term and is given the units of joules per mole. Because we are putting heat into the reaction, we expect that the enthalpy of the heat of solution will be a positive value, as it is an endothermic enthalpy. Once again, the law of energy conservation is applied so that the heat of solution plus the heat of the calorimeter plus the heat of the water is equal to zero. And when we rearrange that, the negative heat of solution is equal to the heat of the calorimeter plus the heat of water. So in order to calculate the heat of solution, we will begin by assuming that the ammonium nitrate does not change the specific heat or the density of the water. It's also important in this step to make sure that your water is as close to room temperature as possible because we will be assuming that the ammonium nitrate and the calorimeter are at room temperature. This way, when we expand the equation for conservation of energy such that the heat of the calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature and the heat of water is equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature, we can see that this would expand such that the heat of the calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity times the final temperature of the solution after all of the ammonium nitrate has dissolved minus room temperature and that the heat of water is equal to the mass of the water that you began with times the specific heat of water times the final temperature of the solution minus the initial temperature of the water. Plug in the values that you get from your experiment and you will have the negative heat of solution. Remember to multiply by negative 1 to get the heat of solution. Finally, you can divide the heat of solution by the number of moles of ammonium nitrate that you dissolved to figure out the enthalpy of dissolving ammonium nitrate. This can be a little bit of a long lab, so it's important to be prepared and think ahead as much as possible. Here are a few tips for success to ensure that you finish the lab on time and get the best data possible. First off, the thermometers that you'll be given to measure temperature will have gradations down to single degrees, and so you need to guess between these gradations in order to figure out the nearest tenth of a degree so that you end up with three sig figs. For example, 22.6. You should have one decimal place in all of your temperature readings. If you do not include these decimal places, your data will be automatically marked wrong. Similarly, your volume measurements should be done in a graduated cylinder that has one mil increments. So if your graduated cylinder has one mil increments, you should be able to guess between these increments to the tenth place so that you have one decimal place in all of your volume measurements as well. When you first begin the experiment, one lab partner can go and collect the calorimeter pieces and assemble the calorimeter, while the other lab partner sets out water to come to room temperature and also begins heating the hot water to 60 degrees Celsius for part B of the experiment.
Please remember to take care when handling the acid and base solutions for Part C. Wear gloves and minimize the opportunity for spills by using large containers to hold your solutions. I hope that this video has clarified some of the points of the lab manual, but please do read through the entire lab manual procedure for more detailed information. Have fun and good luck!